Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Michel and Valérie for inviting me to to present a, a mini course. So the the topic of these three lectures is a domino problem on uh, groups. And uh, for today, we will focus on the historical case of Z2, so the infinite uh, grid. And uh, so I will start with general definition of on groups. So we'll define the general problem for groups. And then I will present you the two main, two main techniques that are known to prove that this decision problem is undecidable for the case where the group is uh, Z2. So first some definitions. Uh, so you may have already seen uh, all these basics of uh, symbolic dynamics. So we will uh, focus on subshifts of finite types, finite type defined on groups. So the principle is that you have, uh, you consider a finitely generated group, you color it with a color chosen among a finite alphabet. This gives you some configurations. And uh, as in the case of dimension one or, or two, uh, this set of configuration can, is compact. This is uh, really important. And you can also give a, a metric. Uh, so definitions are all similar to what uh, exists in dimension one and two, and uh, everything works the same. For example, you can define a metric uh, like this. So to compare two configurations, you look at the first element of the group on which they differ. And uh, just by reading, reading this definition, you may have the impression that actually they, they depend on the choice of the generating set for the groups, but this is not the case. For example, for the metric, it's true that you can define different metrics if you choose different generating sets, but they will all be equi equivalent. So this is something very important. You may sometimes have the impression that the, the, the objects of the problem I will define are specific to one generating set for the group, but in fact, it's not the case. So the objects uh, we will consider are, are subshifts. So there are two ways to define them. So first, in a topological way, you can see them as closed and uh, shift invariant subsets of the set of configuration. But uh, in my talk, I will m consider the, the other way to define them, so the combinatorial definition, and actually, these closed and shift invariant sets are the same uh, as sets of configuration that avoid some patterns. So if you want to define a, a subshift, it's enough to give a, a set of forbidden patterns. And uh, among this uh, subshift, we will concentrate on the subshifts of finite types, so uh, those which can be defined by a finite set of forbidden patterns. So here you, you have a very simple example on Z2. So with two colors, if you forbid these three patterns, so the two last patterns force a, a column to be, to be on uh, only one color. And uh, because of this first forbidden pattern, you can only have three uh, type of configurations, the uniform ones, everything in blue or red, and if the two colors appear, then there is only one way uh, to do so. So you have a, a leftmost, leftmost part in blue and the rightmost in, in red. So this is the object we will uh, consider. And uh, actually, there is a, another way to think about subshifts of finite type. So it's, uh, the idea is to use wrong tiles inside of a finite set of forbidden patterns. So if you, you choose a finitely generated group, a generating set, and wrong tiles will be uh, polygons with uh, two, 
times the size of the generating sets uh, edges. So if you have two generators, you will, you will have squares, but you can also have uh, hexagons and so on. And uh, these tiles, they are, wear a color on each edge. You are given a finite set of such tiles, and you want to color the graph with these tiles, and you have to respect that if you put some tile on the element G of the graph, and if you follow uh, one of the generator, then the colors has, have to match according to uh, the generator. So on Z2, you have uh, these uh, unit squares with the color edges, and uh, subshift of finite type can be seen as sets of tilings by, uh, by the tile set. So uh, what is obvious is that if you are given a, a set of tiles, you can see it as a particular case of subshift of finite type, and the converse is also true, actually, uh, by looking at the higher block subshift, you can always transform a, a subshift of an tab inside a set of one tiles that uh, will have the, the same properties. So uh, in the rest of this talk, I will use one tile, but you can uh, think of them as a subshift of an type. So now, what is uh, the domino problem? Uh, so you take one group, and uh, a generating set. And the, the domino problem is the following. Uh, we wonder whether it's possible to, to describe an algorithm with uh, the following behavior. You give uh, it a set of one tiles, a finite set of one tiles, and the algorithm has to compute so that it, it uh, answers you yes or no, depending on uh, the existence of a valid tiling by the the set of tile or not. So this is a decision problem. And uh, the, the big question is, is it possible to characterize groups for which there exists an algorithm that solves this problem? Is it possible to, yes, to say which groups have a decidable domino problem? Uh, so again, you, you may say that maybe this problem depends on the set S you have chosen, because the, the, the tiles will depend on the set S. But this is not the case, and uh, you can prove that the decidability of this problem is uh, really a property of the group itself. And even more, more than that, it's a geometric property. But I will uh, discuss all of this uh, tomorrow. So. We have defined our problem, and uh, what I would like to do is to present you two proofs uh, of the indecidability of this problem on Z2. So, the first proof will use uh, Turing machines. So, uh, I will explain uh, just on the next slide uh, what they are, if you need some uh, reminders. and. The, print, the sketch of the proof is the following. Uh, we know that there is a, this undecidability of the halting problem of Turing machine, and we will reduce from this problem to prove the undecidability of the, the domino problem. So what is a, a Turing machine? So this is a, the following. So basically, you have a, an infinite tape that is divided into cells. Each cell carries a symbol chosen among a finite alphabet. So in my example, we have three, sim three symbols, A, B, parallel, and this is uh, the special, uh, the blank symbol, meaning that there is nothing uh, written on the tape. And uh, on this step, there is a, a small uh, finite automaton that can move and can read the content of the tape and modify it depending on uh, its internal state and the content of the tape. So uh, 
the behavior of the machine is described by, by its uh, transition rules. So here they are summarized in this uh, array. And uh, so if you start with some configuration, so uh, an infinite tape and the state, you can run the machine just by reading the transition in your here. So for instance, you start with state Q0, you read a symbol blank. Uh, so here you read what you have to do. You have to change your state for QB plus to write an A on the tape and move to the right. So we can do it and so on. We can uh, make the machine uh, evolve like this. So on this uh, simple example, it's not difficult to be convinced that if I uh, let it run, we will never be in the situation of uh, this symbol. So I, I haven't explained what is uh, this symbol. So it stands for a, a halting state. So if, for example, I'm in state Q0 and I read A, this means that the machine will halt. And if you uh, look at the example, what you will see is that starting on the tape initially filled with blank symbols, the machine will just enumerate words a n b n for every integer n. So uh, this machine will never stop, never halt if you start on the empty tape. But uh, in general, this problem of knowing whether a machine halts or not is difficult, and actually it's uh, undecidable. So um, there is no algorithm that can tell you if you give it a, a machine and an input word, a finite word, uh, no algorithm can say whether the machine will halt or not on this input. And uh, actually, the, the variant of the problem that we will use in the SQL is a so-called blank tape halting problem. So here, the input of the algorithm is just a machine, and the algorithm, algorithm has to say whether the machine stops or not on the empty input. And again, no such algorithm exists, and the blank tape halting problem is also undecidable. So, we have the, these, uh, these two, actually, uh, this undecidable problem, and we would like to use it to prove the undecidability of the tiling problem. So where does the, this idea come? So we have seen uh, Wong tiles are just a way to express some uh, local constraints on configuration, so you just forbid things uh, according to two neighbor tiles. And a Turing machine is nothing more than a finite automaton that moves on a tape. So to, to compute, a machine only has to know its internal state and the content of the tape where the, the head is. So it only needs local information to compute. So it seems reasonable to find an encoding of the behavior of a Turing machine inside the one tile, since both uh, models are local uh, in some sense. So we can try to, oops, to do it. Uh, so here is a, an attempt. So we want to encode the behavior of one particular Turing machine uh, in a, a set of one tiles. So first, we need to code with tiles the case where we have no computation head. So what will we do uh, in our tilings, our tilings is that uh, a row in the tiling will stand for the configuration of the machine at some time t, and the row just above will code the configuration of the machine at time uh, t plus one, and so on. And what we would like to do is to express uh, the behavior of the machine with tiles. So if there is no computation head, uh, so what we can do is just copy out the content of the tape and nothing else. Uh, 
since we want to reduce to the blank tape halting problem, we need to code that the initial configuration is the empty tape with uh, the state Q0. So we can do it with uh, this tile. We have the head of the machine and this other tile that will code the rest of the, the tape. And uh, for every transition of the machine, for example, this one, uh, if you read an A and the R is state Q, then you write an A prime and move to state Q prime, and the head does not move, you can code it with this style. So the, the head does not move. And if there is a movement of the head, for example, to the right, you can code it with these two tiles. So you will see that the computation head will move uh, to the right. And the content of the tape is also modified uh, according to the, to the rule. And the same if you go to the left. And we also complete the set of tiles with these tiles just to have a, a tiling of the whole plane. And so what we would like to have, we ideally we would like our tile set. Uh, maybe you cannot read what is written here. Uh, what we would like to have is that this tile set admits a tiling if and only if our initial machine does not halt on the empty input. So if we manage to construct such a tile set, then we are done and we have proved that the domino problem is also indecidable. Otherwise, we could solve, solve the halting problem of Turing machine. So with uh, the tile set presented here, we just get rid of all the tiles that uh, have an halting state. So we keep only all the other tiles. And uh, OK, it seems quite good, because if the machine does not halt on the empty input, then it's possible to construct the tiling of the wall plane. So you just code uh, the empty uh, tape here with blank symbols. And you can run the computation on the machine. And the idea is that if you've managed to tell uh, until, um, let's say, this row, then you can tell the next row if only if the machine can compute and does not enter a final state. So this is good. But the problem is that, as you can see, uh, we have this tile, or this one, and this one, and this one. And the problem is that this tile set can actually always produce tilings. So this does not help a lot, because we need our tile set to tile the whole plane only if the machine does not halt. So we have not proven the undecidability of the domino problem, but we have proven something. Actually, if we force, uh, sorry, I go back to the picture. If we force this tile to appear, oops, sorry, <laughs> then necessarily there will be a computation uh, inside the tiling. And we have proven something a little bit different. So we have proven uh, the undecidability of a variant of the domino problem, which is called the origin constraint domino problem. And uh, this time, instead of having just a set of tiles as, as input, you give, in addition, one tile of the tile set, and you ask whether there exists a valid tiling with the constraint that the tile given in input appears at the origin. So uh, this, is a, this is not equivalent to the, well, we don't know whether it's equivalent or not to the domino problem. Um, the only thing we can say is that if you can solve this problem, then you can solve the domino problem with no constraint, because you just have to run in parallel the algorithm that solves this problem for all the possible tiles uh, at the origin. But this is the, the only thing we, we can say. So we have proven this problem is undecidable, but for now, we do not know about the non-origin constraint problem. And uh, 
the idea is that we want to force uh, some computation to appear in, in the tilings. And to do so, we, we need to, um, to define some computation zones. So with the, if, you, if we can fix, uh, maybe I will go there. If you can fix a tile at the origin, wh what you define actually is an infinite in time and space computation, computation zone where your machine will uh, run. And, uh, but uh, this time compactness is not a good thing because, because of compactness of the space, we cannot force one particular tile to appear exactly once in every tiling. So uh, <coughs> for any tile set, we cannot force uh, one specific starting point to appear exactly once. And this is something not specific to the set of tiles uh, that we have constructed before. It's something very general. So the idea of building only one infinite computation zone is not a good idea. So maybe we can try to construct finite computation zone, but arbitrarily big ones. So uh, as a, an idea, we could try to make some uh, small squares that become bigger. And uh, so just by local rules, it's possible to construct a, a structure like this one. So you, let's say you have squares of size two by two. You gather them by two to get squares of size four by four and so on. And if you manage to construct with a tile set such a structure, the only thing you have to do now is to put your tile that initiates the computation here and you will have a, an infinity of finite computation everywhere. But since you have arbitrarily big squares, actually, you know that if your machine never halts on the empty input, then you will have a tiling. But if the machine halts, then Necessarily, there will be a computation zone big enough to make this halting state appear, and the tiling will be forbidden. So, if we could do uh, something like this, we could solve the, the general domino problem. But unfortunately, again, uh, compactness is uh, against us, because if you can produce these arbitrarily big rect rectangles or squares, the problem is that uh, you will have arbitrarily big uh, zones with nothing. Thus, by compactness, you will also have an infinite tiling with nothing and with no computation in particular. So uh, this other idea is uh, maybe a little bit better, but not enough to solve our problem. And actually, the solution is to, to fill in of this space with uh, something. And um, I will uh, describe it uh, just uh, in the next slides. The idea is, again, to construct finite computation zones, arbitrarily big, but with a lot of intersections so that you avoid these uh, big empty zones. Uh, and this is uh, the idea of the Robinson tiling. So, uh, here is a, a set of tiles, so there are not exactly Wang tiles, but you can uh, easily transform them into Wang tiles. So I just add some uh, blue lines. It doesn't change the, the tiles, but it's just to visualize the, the structure of the tilings. So you can uh, rotate all the tiles and also reflect them. And Maybe it's not obvious, but this tile set has a property to admit at least one tiling, and we can describe its structure. And uh, actually, we'll see that all possible tiling will look like the one I will present you. 
So how can we construct a tiling? I will just show you how to construct large patterns. They will all have the same structure, and by compactness, this will give us a, a tiling of the whole plane. So what we can do with the tile is uh, we can uh, construct these three by three squares. So uh, these four are just uh, rotations of uh, each other. And if you look at them, actually, this three by three uh, square here is actually th the same as this bumpy tile. And um, so it's not exactly a substitution, but the idea is uh, almost the same. The principle is that once you have these three by three squares, you can put them together to construct a bigger square. Uh, so you just have to pay attention on the the different markings on the edges of the tiles. And actually, you don't have a lot of solutions to, to complete this tiling. You have uh, three choices, this one, this one, or this one. And if you choose this one, then the rest of the, the cross here will be uniquely determined. And so once you have this seven by seven square, again, you can use it, you rotate it, and you put the f it behaves like this tile. You put the four copies like this, and you can uh, fill in the, the cross here to get a bigger tiling, and so on. So it's possible to tile the whole plane with this tiling. And um, the structure of the tiling is uh, well. You can describe it as a hierarchy of squares. So you have small squares, or three by three squares, that are gathered by four to give seven by seven square, that are themselves gathered by four, etc., to give uh, bigger and bigger squares. Um, and the point is that if you try to tile uh, the plane in a different way with this tile set, you, you cannot do something very, really different from uh, from this, you are forced to construct this hierarchy of squares. Uh, why is it so? Uh, so, well, we go a little bit fast on this part, but the idea is that there is, an, if you forbid about the, the marking on the middle of the edges, you have only two shapes of tiles, uh, the tiles with bumpy corners and the one with dented corners, and with these two shapes, you don't have a lot of choices. Either you uh, put the bumpy tiles on a lattice like this, either you put them on this lattice. And actually, this case is not possible because of the marking on the, on the middle of the edges. Uh, and you, you can also uh, eliminate some possibilities just by looking at the marking, and at the end, what you can prove is that the only way to, uh, to tile the plane it is to construct the same structure as we have done uh, just before. So, uh, what about the, the domino problem? So we have this hierarchy of squares and uh, what we would like to do is to put computation of Turing machine uh, inside uh, these squares. So the first thing we will do is to forget about uh, squares of uh, odd level. So for example, we erase uh, up squares of level two, three, four, and, uh, and so on. And so you, you get this structure. So what we, you can do, if you look at the, the smallest square, so there are two by two squares. And what you can do is put uh, Turing machine computation. Okay, so this time, uh, times goes uh, from top to bottom. And you can just, by forcing this tile to appear in the top left corner, you will force small computations to appear in the small uh, squares. So you can fill all the small squares like this. And now we have to explain 
how to fill in the rest of the tiling. So it's not that uh, obvious because if you look at the square of the next level, for example, this one, you have already used all this uh, place and you, you cannot reuse it, reuse it to put another tile because each, uh, yes, each tile will be embedded into infinitely many squares. So you, you cannot say that you use it for every tile uh, that contain it. So, and the, the magic of the Robinson tiling is that still there is enough place to compute something uh, in this uh, bigger square. And what we do is that we select some cells that will be used for computation. So you have uh, here a disconnected four by four square in green. And there, are, there is still enough place in the remaining cells to reconnect the four by four square just by uh, making uh, the cells communicate by here, here, and here. So on the next level, we can also put some, uh, put some Turing machine computation, but uh, yes, it's a little bit tricky. And you can uh, do the same for the level after. And so this time, the, the square is even more disconnected, but still there is enough place to uh, make sure that all uh, cells can communicate with, uh, with the other. So finally, what we have, we have uh, arbitrarily big computation zones that intersect a lot, but we can nevertheless put some uh, computation of Turing machine uh, inside them. So if we combine uh, the tile set that encodes the Turing machine with the Robinson tiling in the way I've tried to explain you, what you obtain is that for a given Turing machine, you can construct a tile set that can tile the plane if and only if the machine does not halt on the empty input. So we have a reduction and we have proven that the domino problem is undecidable uh, on the infinite grid. So this, is, uh, this was uh, the first proof of the undecidability of the domino problem on Z2. Uh, so historically, it is uh, the first uh, that was given, so in 1966 by Berger, and the proof was simplified uh, later by uh, Robinson. And um, a few years later, um, so the proof is due to Carey in uh, 2007. Uh, another proof was given, so this time, uh, well, we, we cannot really get rid of Turing machines uh, because at some point we need the halting problem. But this time the idea is to encode another computational model inside the Wang tiles. And the model uh, chosen here is piecewise affine maps. So the, the sketch of the proof is a bit, uh, a bit longer, so you have more reductions. Uh, so I, I won't detail the first point, but uh, it's known that the mortality problem of Turing machine is undecidable, and uh, we can reduce it from the mortality problem of this piecewise affine map, and then uh, and by encoding uh, these affine maps inside one tile, we, uh, we will conclude uh, about the, the domino problem. So. Uh, first, let me present you the mortality problem of Turing machines. Uh, so, what is mortality? So, you, you take a Turing machine with a halting state, and uh, for this slide, you, you do not consider only configuration with a finite support, so you, you can code everything you want on the, on the tape in input. So previously, what I, what I said is that you could give as input a finite word, but for this problem, we allow uh, any tape you want. So you can encode uh, anything you want on your tape. 
And uh, so now a configuration of the machine is uh, so a tape, an infinite sequence of symbols, a state, and we say that a configuration is a non-halting configuration if just by running the machine on it, you will never reach the halting state. And so the mortality problem is the following. As input, you take a, a machine with a halting state, and you want to know whether such a non-halting configuration exists or not. Uh, so this problem uh, has been proven undecidable so by Hooper in uh, 1966, so it's uh, amazing to see that it's the same year as the proof by Berger of uh, the domino problem. And I won't detail the proof because uh, I can't uh, understand the details. It's very technical and uh, you have, uh, I think, two or three reductions and you use uh, counter machines to, to conclude the undecidability of the problem. Well, nevertheless, we we have this undecidable problem, and uh, how can we use it with the, the domino problem? So, first we will uh, need to speak about the mortality problem of piecewise affine maps this time. So what is a, a piecewise affine map? Um, so you... You take a, a unit square and uh, you have an affine transformation uh, that sends it to, uh, to something. And you consider finitely many of this unit square with uh, integer coordinates. So this square will be sent to, let's say, this. And maybe a last one. Uh, and if you take any point in the, okay, maybe three maps are enough. So. You can define the, a global partial map on uh, R2. It will, it will be defined so piecewise uh, on the union of the domains uh, UI. And if you take a point in... Uh, okay, so my example is not very good. Where can I start? Okay, let's start here. If you take a point in, point in R2, so in the domain of the function, so what you can do is try to iterate the function and see whether you can do it uh, indefinitely. So uh, here I can again apply uh, f and I will arrive uh, here. And then I, uh, I just went out of the domain, so this starting point was not immortal. But you can wonder, given uh, a rational system of maps like this. So by rational, I mean that the, the coefficient of the matrices that define the fi are rational, and the translation part is also rational. Uh, so given such a system, you can wonder whether it has or not an immortal starting, starting point, whether you can uh, find some point or on which you will always stay inside the, the definition domain of f. So uh, we can prove this problem is also indecidable uh, by reduction of the mortality problem of Turing machines. So this time we will use uh, the moving tape model for Turing machine. So in what I've described before, you had a computation head that moves 
on the tape. But you can uh, equivalently define the, the same machine with the same behavior, except that uh, instead of uh, moving the head, you just move the tape and the head stays uh, at the origin. So if the tape moves on the, the right, the tape has to move to the left. And, uh, so we will use this version of Turing machine for, for this reduction. Uh, what else? Yes, so we we see the the alphabet of the machines and the, the set of states as uh, integers. And uh, from this machine, we will construct a system of uh, rational uh, affine maps as follows. So we will code a configuration of the machine with uh, two real numbers. Uh, one transition of the machine will be coded by one affine map. And, and this is uh, the most important, what we want to have is that the system will have a, an immortal starting point if and only if the Turing machine has a, an immortal configuration. So. The idea is that uh, you can code the, the configuration, so the tape plus the state of the machine with two real numbers. So the left part of the tape So this part of the tape will be coded by uh, the infinite sum uh, written here. And you code so the, the state plus the right part of the tape bar by another integer, which is here. And if you choose this integral m big enough, then this is a real coding, meaning that if you are given uh, one L and one R, you can find the configuration of, of the Turing machine that it corresponds to. And so, why is it convenient to, to choose this coding? So first, if you look at the integral part of this R, so it's just uh, mq plus uh, x0. So if you know the integral part of R, then you have all the information you need to, uh, to make one step of computation for the machine, because you know the state and you know the content of the tape. And um, uh, what, uh, so what transitions, how can you cut them? So, for example, consider this transition. So the, the head moves to the right, so the tape moves to the left. And the idea is that if you want to code a movement of the tape, you only need to shift these two real numbers, the two sums. So, for example, if you want to move the head to the right, so to move the tape to the left, you can code it by... Uh, a matrix transformation. So this matrix will shift your tape to the left. So you will move uh, the head, sorry, here. And uh, what you have to do is to adjust the translation part of your transformation to code the new state and the new uh, symbol. Uh, so you can do it uh, symmetrically if you want to to code a transition that moves the tape to the left. So the matrix will look like uh, 
this, and you also have a translation part. Uh, again, you have to adjust it. And if the transition codes no movement of the head, then the matrix part is just uh, the identity. So, and uh, yes, you can also notice that uh, the uh, fine transformation you define here as uh, a domain with uh, integer coordinates and for different states, the domains will be disjoint. So the last thing we have to check, so we can transform a Turing machine into a, a system of uh, rational piecewise affine maps. And uh, you can check that if the Turing machine has an immortal starting point, then the system has one and uh, reciprocally uh, also. So finally, you, we can prove the following. So the mortality problem is also insidable for uh, piecewise FN maps. So the last step of the proof now is to code these affine maps inside Wang tiles. So how can we do it? Uh, so consider uh, such a transformation of the plane. And uh, so for the moment, don't preoccupate with uh, the values you put uh, here on the edges of uh, of the tile, so at the end we will have uh, integers on the top and the bottom sides and a rational number on the left and the right side. Uh, so what we want to do is to, to make computations with one tiles and to do so Uh, we say that a one tile computes a function if we have the following. So if you look at uh, what is written on the bottom edge of the tile, actually it's the image of the top edge of the tile by the function, and you maybe the computation is not exact. So you have some uh, carries on the left and the right uh, edges. So this is a definition of a, a tile that computes a, a function. And what is nice with this definition is that if you restrict to uh, affine maps and you look at what happens on a row, so if you put uh, a lot of tiles together to tile a finite portion of a row, uh, what happens? So you know that by local rules, the carries on two consecutive tiles will be the same on the right and the left edges. So that if you sum all these equalities for every tiles, and you divide by the number of tiles, uh, also because your map is affine, you get the following formula. So it means that if you uh, look at the average of the labels on the bottom side, then the number coded will be the image of the average of the label of the top side. And we also have a small carry. And what is very nice is that uh, if we can choose the values of the carries in finite number, so if we can find a finite set of tiles to code our function, this will go to, zeros, to zero as uh, k grows to infinity. So on a, a finite portion of a, of a row, you still have a non-exact computation, but when you look at uh, an infinite row, actually your computation becomes uh, exact. Um, so this is what we would like to, to get. And to precisely define the, the set of tiles for a given uh, a fine map, we need the notion of a representation of a real number. So if you 
you start with a, some real number, you can, you will say that uh, a sequence of two consecutive integers code it if by averaging the values of the, yes, uh, the values of the integers on bigger and bigger uh, intervals, you tend to this x. So it's possible to define one representation for every uh, real number. So uh, this one is called the balance representation of the real number. So what you do is that you take the integral part of k of x minus the integral part of k minu minus one times x for every k. Uh, you can check that this always belong to uh, this two element set, two uh, element set, and this defines a sequence. So if your real number is between zero and one, you have a sequence and of zero and ones that uh, represents your number. And uh, yes, yeah, so for our problem, we are in dimension two, so we just uh, defined a representation of a point in R2 coordinate by coordinate. And uh, if your point is in this domain, you know that the possible value for this, uh, this thing can be only these four uh, couples of uh, integers. So we have, we have everything in hand to define a tile set. Uh, so if you are given uh, this affine map, so a matrix with a rational coefficient and a, a vector with also rational coordinates, what you do is that for every integer and every real uh, sorry, every point in the domain of definition, you consider this tile. So on the top edge, you put this integer, on the bottom, this one, and on the left, you adjust the carry so that you can check that this tile computes fi in the sense I've uh, defined before. And uh, so, of course, if, when you read this, so I define a uh, I maybe define infinitely many tiles because I define these tiles for every integer k and every x in, uh, in the domain. But actually, you can prove that only finitely many tiles are needed. Why? Because uh, we have seen that the domain u is bounded, so these integers can be only uh, well the bounds on the of the domain, and moreover the function is a uh, uh, with rational coefficient. So by a small calculation, you can prove that these two carries can be chosen as a rational numbers, and they are also bounded. So you only need finitely many uh, values to get. Uh, a set of tiles that will compute your function. So what we have done, uh, we started with a system of rational affine maps, uh, and we have transformed each of this affine map into a finite set of tiles. So now what you do is uh, we use a an additional marking on the tile. Uh, we want to be sure that on a given row, we have only tiles from uh, some TIs that appear, so we just put a, an additional color on the tiles, and we define a big set of tiles that has the following property. So every row will be colored with uh, tiles from one single ti, and the most important part is the last uh, item. So it's possible to tile the plane if and only if the system has an immortal point. So uh, how can you, can you see it? So if the system has an immortal point, then you can easily produce a tiling. What you do is that you put 
the balance representation of your immortal point here. And just by the definition of the set of tile, you know that here you will have the balance representation of its image uh, by f, and so on. And uh, so the other, uh, the reciprocal statement is a, a little bit tricky. So suppose you can uh, uh, tile the plane with this new set of tiles. You, you are not sure that the sequence of integers you can read on a given row is indeed a representation of some numbers. But what you can always do is extract from this sequence something that will be a representation of a number so that you will really code the orbit of some point of the system and uh, so that if you can tile the plane then it means that you have uh, an immortal uh, starting point. So, and this is uh, the second proof of the undecidability of the, the domino problem on Z2. So I think I will stop here. So what you have seen, uh, so we have seen these two different, different proofs. So the idea and the realization are really different. On the one hand, you have uh, this idea of constructing a hierarchy of, of squares. And uh, on the second proof, you, you just, yes, code the orbits of uh, a small dynamical system inside the, the one tiles. But in both uh, proofs, of course, the idea is to encode a, a computational <coughs> model uh, inside the one tiles. And so I will end with, with a question. What about finitely generated groups? So how can these two techniques can be uh, generalized or adapted to, to some groups? And I will try to answer this question tomorrow. So thank you. Does it enough to have a constant number of tiles for this problem to become undecidable? Sorry, to have a constant so number? if we bound uh, the number of tiles by some constant, yes. does this problem uh, remain undecidable? So, but uh, what you can do is you... So you, you transform the domino problem into... Uh, you parameter by the number of tiles, so... Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, so for, for each machine, it is certainly uh, finite, but uh, so is it finite in ah, general okay. for any machine? Is it bounded for some constant? So what you would like to do is to encode any Turing machine insti inside the set of tile w which, with the size bounded by some constant? Yeah. Uh, no, no, not in this proof, uh, I mean just if we consider the problem where the number of tiles is uh, bounded by some constant. So in any case, yes. by some uh, particular constant. We fix a constant and we say that, so we have a problem where uh, no more than say five tiles. Okay, so I think you can find, uh, well, I don't know what would be the <laughs> exact value, but you have very small universal Turing machines, so it's enough to encode them uh, inside a uh, one tile to get the indecidability. And so, uh, as long as, uh, fine, well, if your constant is bigger than the number of tiles needed to encode these universal Turing machines, then uh, it's undecidable. But yes, maybe for very small uh, number of tiles, you can decide it. Uh, but there is a constant such that uh, it is undecidable, right? Yes, yes, yes. So, yes, yeah, what given by uh, the universal Turing machine? Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.